Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Welcome to The Advocate, where we lay bare the topical issues of the day. No holds barred. My advocacy this week has a ring of urgency. I'm saying it's time to raise the bar. In fact, it's now or never. Nafisa will be delivering a short and punchy advocacy on the rule of law, or at least the absence of it. Elsie is no first timer, although she's fresh to the show. She'll be schooling us on the fundamentals of the rape culture. Seydou is also drawing our attention to a timely need for a neglected practice. He says, purpose is preceded by reflection. Libras is not one to carry last. He speaks on the incredible matter of missing credentials among our leadership. He seems to be saying, the last shall be the first. Some might say we're out to crack open Pandora's box with our advocacies, and they just might have a point. We'll be getting straight to it after the break. Happy birthday, Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to our own dear Kene. Happy birthday to you. Thank you very much. How old are you now? I will tell you. Let's just... <laughs> Whereas the expression raising the bar normally speaks of elevating the standard, where mediocrity is the norm, it has to first speak of bringing things up to par. I'll be speaking about raising the bar, it's now or never. Often I ask, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Some might say, who cares? But actually, it can make all the difference. How often have you heard it said that unless Nigerians are treated with a certain roughness, you will not get compliance? We saw it in the matter of Wike's heavy-handedness in demolishing hotels and rounding up lockdown offenders. We see it in the culture of police brutality, of parents ruling their children, and in some cases, husbands, their wives. We see it in the culture of employers and employees. So I ask, is it that heavy handedness is needed to keep us in line because we're so unpolished and uncivilized? Or does it begin with the fact that we've been mistreated and abused over the years, resulting in our being a little rough around the edges and therefore seeming to need the heavy handed treatment? I heard that when a certain international supermarket chain expanded into Nigeria, they came with hopes of establishing a world standard service with an equally cushy employee package. However, they were swiftly acquainted with the fact that not only could they not treat Nigerian customers like their customers abroad, i.e. they couldn't leave toilet roll out unattended or it would be stolen. It had to be rationed. Furthermore, they couldn't pay their staff the same as their foreign counterparts or they would be spoiling them since Nigerian employees were used to much more rudimentary packages. I ask again, which came first, the uncouth Nigerian or the conditions that socialized them into this unrefined uncouthness? Now, taking things further, should we continue to dumb things down to the standard of the so-called average Nigerian, to what they're familiar with, or do we seek to raise the bar? Do we treat those we have the guardianship over with the standard that is accepted worldwide, that which is humane and right, or do we tailor it downwards to supposedly suit them and us? Because make no mistake, this lowering of the standard is as much due to convenience as it is self-serving. It will certainly cost us to raise the bar in a climate where mediocrity is the measure of what is acceptable, what is the norm. We'll be castigated, criticized, and even mocked by the very people we seek to give benefit to, but no matter. Those who transform cultures and nations must prepare to be pioneers, and in so doing, arm themselves to walk a lonely road, a very, very lonely road, but ultimately, rewarding road. It's through such sacrificial pioneers that new cultures and nations are reborn. 
Other than that, we may as well kiss our dreams of a new Nigeria goodbye. I say it's now or never. What do you say, guys? <laughs> Can I disagree with you completely? Okay. Completely. What, what do you know I'm saying? So let me be sure you're on my page. <laughs> no, no, no. You, 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 you just read your script and um, you asked me if I know what you're saying. Yeah, in case, I disagree in case you, with you. You didn't com grasp my point. Completely. Go ahead. Mm. First and foremost, you talked about um, the new supermarkets and uh, the fact that um, because Nigerians are used to a particular way, so you must treat Nigerians that way. Mm. That's not the no, issue. That, it's, an, a, it's a way of excusing it out. No, no you, you, you actually agree with me. Uh, I'm okay. actually using what that as a point say? that, yeah, say, don't anyway, go, go ahead. Yeah, I think he may That's have excusing me. away the point. Mm. And if we always say here that there are consequences for every action. Mm. But in a place where there are no consequences, because you talked about raising the bar, raising the bar, but mm. at the end of the day, there is no solution to raising the bar apart from areas where the bars are not raised. Okay. That's why I say I disagree with you. Mm. And, and so you need to provide solutions to raising the bar. Mm. When the new generation banks came, mm. they raised the bar. And when they raised the bar, you know, the old generation banks had no other options but to koto the new norm. In governance, when you raise the bar, when um, Fashola came, he raised the bar of governance. And that was what even better the APC you're seeing today. Everybody started asking for that thing that is happening in Lagos. We want to see it also in our state. Mm. When um, uh, Atairo Jerga came, in INEC, he raised the bar to say, look, we need to sanitize this process. And until we sanitize this process, we can't have credible election. And he raised that bar, but unfortunately, the Supreme Court have dropped the bar again by jettisoning the technology that he introduced. The problem that we have here is the fact that we talk about all of the issues where you, the bar is not raised, but without providing a solution on how to raise the bar and the areas that we need okay. to raise the bar. Well, that is where I have a problem. LC, well, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to I it, hopefully. I you and I get what you're saying, but mm. for me, I think it has become a psychological issue. That's why I was addressing because it the psyche. Because we are at the point where mediocrity is celebrated. So you build a borehole and it's celebrated. You do this and it's celebrated. But at the end of the day, it is because the system has been left to decay to the point where it becomes a culture. So the point is, like he said, how do we move forward? What do we begin to do? And which is why I will always say that the NOA, that's the National Orientation Agency, has got a lot of work to do. I, I'm not, I can't sit here now to say they are doing the job they are supposed to do. They're not but doing they anything. need they're not to doing engage the people. Uh... And engaging them is not just about putting out content and pushing it out there. You have to break down this communication in a way that people understand the consequences of their action and how the fact that you used something or you drank a bottle of water and threw your bottle out of the window is a ripple effect to the flood that we are experiencing right now. So it has to be breaking down so much so that the layman understands the consequences of their own action. So let, I, I, let I really... Me, sorry, we we'll need to call know. in the people on there. Yeah, I know where um, it's why waiting for them? I don't know if they are... If okay, they are are you there? there? Why waiting for them? Let's to add to what you've just said. Mm -hmm. The consequences. What's the consequence of drinking a bottle of water and flinging it on Todd Milan Bridge off uh, from your car? There are no consequences for such action. Mm -hmm. What's the consequences of the National Retention Agency not doing their job? There are no consequences. Mm -hmm. um, so he said about this, it's a very lonely but ultimately rewarding road. I, th the thoughts that came into my mind is that when do we move from just one person, one individual pursuing change and making a dent to a group of people pursuing change. Now, sorry, the former speaker talked about um, Atahiru Jega and him bringing technology that made the process in INEC a lot much easier. And then the Supreme Court basically taking it down. So it seems like as if all the effort he has made so far was basically thrown into the dustbin. When do we go from just having one person to having a mass number of people? Because I think that's when challenging the status quo will be more effective. Okay, um, my own contribution would be that we've been, we've been doing catch up for a very long time, you know, trying to see if we'd um, adopt the, either the American system or the British system without realizing that we can actually crop a system that works for us, taking into consideration our diverse nature and all the cultural intrigences, you know. Um, I would say that we can borrow from what they have uh, implemented in Ghana, for instance. 
They have studied and realized that look, the own system of governance has to include the traditional institutions. You know, we really need to dig deep and find something that's peculiar to us as a people. As long as we continue to borrow, all these policies will continue running around in circles without achieving anything. We have culture that is different from theirs. We have our own ways of doing things. So we need to put all of this into consideration and devise a way, you know, to reach, agree as a people on how we're going to move our country forward. Can we quickly break the rule and yeah. okay, let's, let's hear from... Uh, <laughs> well, I guess, I mean, where I'm coming from very quickly, um, because I know we're out of time, was really to look at the psyche. But I, I now, listening to Nafisa, I realize, yes, even my own approach still has something, it's lacking. Yeah. I was saying, look, each individual, wherever you are, don't make the excuse that, oh, Nigerians are not used to this, so I will lower the standard. A lot of times, when you're lowering the standards in terms of, let's say I own a business, I decide to give my employees less because I say they're Nigerians. Meanwhile, you know what is accepted. Yeah. But you're serving yourself. So why don't you, wherever you have the rule or the governance, why don't you task yourself sacrificially to keep the standard up? No, don't but, keep but making the, excuses. What, what the, the problem said, She's saying that that then means only me fighting. It's also an inherent problem. Yeah. Because mm. if someone comes in and does the right thing, mm, and, and there's only one man. Only one man. Yeah. The, the possibility the, of that right why, thing, even, you know, it's... That's, it's, why it's, it's, say, yeah. that's why I'm saying that you know, there should be consequences for every action. Mm. And that's why when you have a government that refuses to build institution and you are telling me, let me go and do it, you know, you be the one that is doing it right. Mm. When every other person is doing it wrong, in a state it's of lawlessness, mm. you back. it is illegal to be I get it. I get so, it. Don't forget so that it's, no, it's also those individuals that are in the government. So yes. if one person in the government cannot be the catalyst to create a change, so how do you expect the citizens to actually The truth the is, I feel we have no choice. As much as I hear what you're saying, we have no choice. We still have to stand up for what is right. That's the way I see it. The fact that everybody else is doing what is wrong, I have to still do what. Sorry, what were you saying? No, I said we have to stand up for what's right as a collective, not yeah. just one individual. But I'm saying even if the collective don't come together, I have no option. I have to do the right thing. That's really where I stand. Whether you do the right thing or Libras does, I have no option. I have to answer to my conscience. As a human being, I have to do the right thing. Yes. Which is why I'm told that we're are, out of time. <laughs> which is why we are here doing the right thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, <laughs> we're out of time on this segment. So much to say. One rule for the goose and another for the gander is certainly a recipe for discontentment. Interestingly, Nafisa is saying much more on this after the break. Over to you, Nafisa. Since a rule is meant to operate in default, where the rule is absent, it stands to reason that what it was meant to enforce is automatically present. When I was in high school, I was taught the concept of the rule of law for the first time by my passionate but late government teacher, Mr. Econ. He always emphasized on equality before the law as man is made equal before God. That a lawless society is close to anarchy and could disintegrate at any given point in time. These lessons still hold true for me today. Fast forward 13 years later, Nigeria has become a nation struggling under the bane of lawlessness. Elected officials who are answerable to the people commit illegal acts with no repercussions. Rapists run amok, destroying the lives of young women, and our government has nothing to say than to constitute tax forces and take pictures to present a facade of busyness. The legislatures who create the laws should not be the ones to break them. Take, for instance, the case of lawmakers who return from trips abroad and refuse to self-isolate in the light of COVID-19. Or let's even take, for instance, the recent case of Naira Mali and BBN alumni Kimopra. And the Play Network, who, you know, flouted the COVID-19 protocols, impersonated a government official, and even hosted a concert right here in Abuja, where I am, with no social distancing, no masks, no what, nothing whatsoever. And they, up till now, are not being held accountable for their actions. Public officials and celebrities are not gods, and the rule of law must take effect. We must shun and dismantle this system, which only detects that the law is for the poor and the petty thief. Everyone, be they rich or poor, must obey the rules that hold the fabric of society together. Because as it stands, that fabric is all but destroyed. Thank you, Nafisa. Um, again, I think it, it, welcome. in a way, your, your, I think your advocacy reminds me of mine. Yeah. And, and, and what was going through my head is we need to remind ourselves when we make excuses for our behavior here that the people abroad, the people in other climes, they don't have two heads. I know we, we started with a deficient system, but 
the fact that it works with other human beings elsewhere means it can work with us. You know? So even though the only area I would dispute with what you said is I'm not quite sure it's, it's been shown that the rich are having it better than the poor overall. Because I know, you know some of the rich, I remember the lady who was um, imprisoned or at least charged uh, what's her name? You know, you guys know because she flouted the rules Funke of yeah. oh. So you know, yeah. we had and they made an example of her. And what became yeah. Badamosi's fit? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but the point is, I'm, I'm saying yes. The I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, you know, there is fit. a difference between being rich and yeah. being rich and connected. Okay, so it's connections exactly. now. Exactly. I mean, that, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I, I sympathize with. I, I think what people need to see is that the same rule applies across board. It's it's more about you know the morale. If people can see that you're not distinguishing, you're not you're not uh, selecting those you favor, then even that impression alone exactly. is enough to make people feel that justice is being done. I'll leave it at exactly, that for now. It looks right now like as if they are selecting who you know they sell justice. Yeah. Take for instance, Nara Mali and Badamosi. They didn't go to court. They were. They, I think they just paid a sum of money and they were left off the hook. Right imagine? now, as we speak, Nara Mali is a second time offender, but he's still running free and tweeting all sorts of things. That if he drops a song today, that everywhere will scatter. That's the problem I you have know, with the system. We're, we're, we're yeah, not, uh, see, let's let's tell ourselves. And it's shameless as well. But for Naramali and Badamos, they actually went to court, but they said they forgave them, and Naramali is supposed to serve some form of community service you see? and all that. Yeah. Okay. And so. That's why he's committing the offense again. It's mm -hmm. the same offense. Yes. He committed one in Abuja. So he's he not sorry. Forgiven. Even though Fuki Akindele and the husband were, were charged and penalty pronounced, mm -hmm. he was forgiven and then he's gone to Abuja to commit the same offense again. Yes. He will be forgiven no probably. And then he will he go do to it Kano again. and commit the offense. He, will be he even knew. He maybe he even calculated it when he went and ahead then, and did the... And so the airline was suspended. And then, you know, I think, uh, was it the pilot or some people were arrested? Mm. And now the people who they said deceived them still, uh, you know, are out there. And so that's why I always say when there are no consequences yeah. for any action, yeah. it, it becomes yeah. lawlessness. And you don't expect me to be law-abiding in a state of lawlessness. <laughs> but you're well, putting, you know, you're putting me back on his But you know you said something. Yes, you said the law has to be seen to be impartial yes, for yes. all. But in See, this what? case now, actually this one in points, where you are seeing Naramali not even focusing on um, flouting the, the protocols and focusing on the executive jet people calling him useless. Imagine. Because he doesn't exactly. even understand the consequences of his own of action. His action. Yeah. But if he did, then he wouldn't have the time or the energy to start... No, he so understands. Sorry, to bring in Seiji because I hear useless. he understands the consequences. Mm. What? Yes, I want to add that, you know, they say the leadership of every nation is the reflection of its people. Now, if we're seeing uh, our leaders go scot-free with all this carefree attitude, I mean, what stops me from, you know, doing anything I want as well? Yeah. We should not deny we're, we're in chaos right now. There's chaos in the country. So how do There's we get no it one. right, Seydou? How do we get it right? How do we get it right? Yeah. It's by choosing the right people and, and you know, let the right people come out and uh, to, to vie for elective office. Hmm. But should we start allowed by to, holding Libros accountable? If you have, He's representing you have the, legal, the legal Shouldn't we start by he, holding he, Libros? He, 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 I have consistently said it, consistently. I don't spare my, my, my constituency. I have maintained any time I have the opportunity to, to tell you that, yes, here, you say the windmill of justice grinds slowly but surely. But we forget that justice delayed is justice denied. You need to marry the two. And it is people that enforces these rules. It is people that are judges. It is people that are police. It is people that are prosecutors. And, and prosecutor like prosecution that we say, like we say, starts from investigation mm. until we understand it from that point of view, where there are consequences. Yeah. There are monitoring and enforcement of rules. Yeah. Who polices the police? Yeah. You know, we can't. We, we, have, just, we need to have those systems. Take, for example, like Seydou said, accountability. Naramali does it today, yeah, and nothing happens. Next thing you will hear that Bonaboy will want to do it. After all, <laughs> yeah. Naramali did it. Yeah. It now become a, an open challenge. Yeah. Who will yeah. deceive uh, uh, airlines? So now Naramali has got, gotten off it, it seems. What can we do to now call out the people who've let you, Naramali You asked them, say, do the same question. Yeah. And I want to respond to Please. what he has said. Because mm. if you say um, we should get the right leaders elected, let's look at Nigeria as a whole and what our political system is saying. What are the chances of that right candidate? Get it. Did you vote in the last election? I did. Did you vote? Mm -hmm. 
and when you voted, mm -hmm. you waited to see. No, I didn't know. You see now? So if everybody who went to vote Has waited, yes. how would that Because you're in a desperate vote? situation. Okay, I think this, I waited. This, we have I to, counted we, the votes. We have to wrap up. And where did it get you? But please, let's, take, let's, let's take it to the next, let's take it to the somewhere. next segment. There is a first time for everything. Welcome to The Advocate on Plus TV Africa. I'll be talking on the fundamentals of rape culture. The issue of rape in recent times has been the top discussion in the news and on social media. I think it's time we discuss what and how to solve this issue holistically. Data on sexually violent individuals show that most direct their acts at individuals whom they already know. Alcohol has been shown to play a critical role in certain types of sexual assault, as have some other drugs. We also have cases um, where rape or gang rape is a test of readiness and loyalty to becoming a member of court groups. There is evidence to suggest that sexual violence is also a learned behavior in some adults, particularly in regard um, to child sexual abuse. Studies on sexually abused boys have shown that around one in five continue in later life to molest children themselves. Childhood environments that are physically violent, emotionally unsupportive, and characterized by competition for scarce resources have been associated with sexual violence. Sexually aggressive behavior in young men, for instance, has been linked to witnessing family violence and having emotionally distant and uncaring fathers. Men raised in families with strongly patriarchal structures are also more likely to become violent, to rape, and use sexual coercion against women, as well as to abuse their intimate partners than men raised in homes that are more gender balanced and friendly. Sexually, violent men have been shown to be more likely to consider their victims as responsible for the rape and are less knowledgeable about um, the impact of rape on their victims, a state of mind termed objectification. Such men may misread cues given out by women in social situations and may lack the inhibitions that act to suppress association between sex and aggression. Another factor involving social relationships is a family response that blames women without punishing men, concentrating instead on restoring lost family honor. Such a response creates an environment in which rape can occur with impunity. The research on convicted rapists has found several important motivational factors in the sexual aggression of males. Those motivational factors repeatedly implicated are having anger at women and having the need to control or dominate them. Additionally, as reported by several rapists, they are attracted by what women wear. Now, how do we begin to solve these issues? Because I believe that we need to begin to look at the root cause of the issue rather than saying someone has been raped, what is the law saying, why exactly would a young man think that having a woman forcefully, or even a child, is the way to do. Wow. I mean, thank you for that breakdown. Libros, did you want to come in? I, I, no, I want... no. You... <laughs> thank you for that breakdown. I mean, I, but somehow I feel that it still takes me back to, we still need to establish fundamentally that rape is wrong first and foremost. Mm -hmm. There's no condition under which you are permitted to take sex by force. You know, because I feel until we block all those excuses people give, whether it's to talk about what women are wearing, whether it's to talk about whether they were unsure. Let's establish first and foremost that taking sex without consent is wrong. And so under no circumstances mm -hmm. will you be let off the hook. Once that is a clear message being sent out, I think everything else will fall into place. And maybe it comes back to Libros' point that he keeps making. There has to be some punishment that is clearly being meted out mm -hmm. consistently. People come and stand for it inflexibly. So everybody gets that message, almost like the ABC. Of, of what is right. So it brings us back to the same issue of society, um, pressure. A lady is raped. Um, the la you know, in, we live in a patriarchal society where you know, the man dominates. You have um, daughters, you have sons. The daughter will always go to the kitchen while the sons who watch football are allowed to sit in the sitting room. You know, and, and so the lady is seen as um, the lesser being while the man is up there. And so the man also is given the impression that he can control, you know, he can have everything he wants. Mm. And then when this thing happens, rather than, you know, allow the consequences of such behavior 
to immediately you know take Follow place activated through. instrumentalities of the law what we do is there's pressure oh you know don't bring the name of the family into disrepute mm -hmm. let's see how we can cover it oh you want to you want to allow the devil to use you to bring down the pastor the police will say you know why don't you just allow collect money from the man after all you're adult even do yourself the way you were dressed oh you, why yeah, will you, you dress, enjoy him uh, or uh, why will you visit a man at that ungodly hour you know so with all of these things the moment there are consequences for action immediately it happens there will be no excuse mm. irrespective of I'm who saying. is involved and then lastly the lastly this may sound very unpopular mm -hmm. the idea of having brothers is very necessary if you go to europe they are making a kill from brothers we also need society police should not be hounding all these club guests but, but you are you're, you're speaking me, two sides of it. No, 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 no. Because you're creating you, the excuse now. No, because you seem no, to be suggesting no, that the brothels will ease the rape. I, I, yes, I, I of course not. You no, shouldn't rape. See, I'm like saying that. No, let me, me. Please I'm finish and I'll make my point. It's not an excuse. It sounds like an excuse. What I'm telling you is there are people who willingly want to participate in such a trade. You know, also they are human beings. It's their rights allow them, provide an environment for them also where they can be taken care of and where they also can make money safety. and ensure their I'm safety and government finish. will tax them. It's a job. Okay. But a situation where, where because you think it is uh, where they are also hounded. We're talking about rape. Do you know how many of such guests police rape mm -hmm. almost every evening? They raid them. Libras, and, Libras, no, because I'm, you say I'm to wait it for is, you to land, but I have to come in. Because I'm you sorry, say I, it is not Libras, a, let me, a let me, no, 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 It no. is in I'm, not, I'm not even talking about the morality okay. of brothels now. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you that there is no causal link between brothels and rape. It, 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 it is. Coming. It is. Simply, it's like saying to somebody, oh, if your house is on display, this is back to the same thing of where, how you dress. You're saying that if you make available prostitutes for me to have sex with, then I'll stop raping women. You're mm -hmm. a rapist. You need to control your lust. It's like saying to a thief, if you see him in a, a house, if you don't put the wall up, I have a right to go in and steal it. Are you not no, dealing? No, 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 Let's okay. deal with the fundamentals. Okay, I want to state this no. again without equivocation. Okay, no, Anybody okay, who no. rapes has a problem. Okay, they have a problem. Okay, it has nothing to do with whether you provide them with an what enabling environment problem? or not. Okay, they have a fundamental problem. She they need to rein in their lust. Okay, Period. I'm not even interested in anything it. else. She graduated it. You are creating reasons. a back door. You're giving an no. excuse for people. She graduated. She gave various reasons why this thing happens. Mm -hmm. so and I'm also telling you that this also in. can so be we'll one see. way one of the you solutions. can check it. Okay. Don't, don't close the, the door. I'm, I'm closing it's, the door on that because it's, it's, it's not about saying that. I'm saying you're an Afisa. You can't. I want to quickly add that in engineering we say you want to solve problem from first principle. We need to go back to the root cause of this thing, and I'll take you back to the family. However, I want to call our attention that you know that there are certain cultures in this country where uh, they offer their wives to their uh, guests when they come. Now, imagine somebody like that, what his thinking would be for a woman. They see a woman as an object. Do you understand? Yeah. So if you don't do a reset for those kind of culture, expunge and reorientate these people, then it will be mm -hmm. wrong to those you know, met for them punishment that they don't understand. In my own culture, you know, my, my friend would offer his wife for me free of charge and it's okay. Why should you think, why should, why should you hold me liable for rape? Okay. So it's, it's, it's a mindset that has to be reset from the family. Hi, Sergio. Thank you very much for your point because it's actually part of the things I wanted to say that there are two critical components when it comes to the issue of rape. The first culture, we need to stop objectifying women and in totality as objects or as things that we can, men can control. That's the first step. Second of all, we need to stop telling young girls, telling women in total that, you know, it's, there's something you did that made this happen to you. They are the victims. They are not the cause of their misfortune. We need to get to that point and where they feel no shame or no stigma in coming out, knowing that they were not the cause of what befell on them. And like thirdly, 
we need to have consequences. I'm very happy for the. I think the VAP Act is undergoing a public hearing today in Bauchi State, and we're just hoping that it will be domesticated in the 36 states of the Federation. The VAP Act um, prescribes life imprisonment for all rapists once convicted, and that's like a milestone when it comes to Nigerian legislation. Okay, so let's look at it holistically. How yeah. do we solve it from the family angle to the law angle to society, um, society angle to whatever they need More to be provided angle. with? You know, just let's look at it with a broad view, basically. Whereas our advocacy are a way of holding up our collective dreams and aspirations, without your contribution, that picture is incomplete. On the danger of laboring, Debbie Benson says, brilliant. Laboring and self-fulfilling prophecy, words are powerful tools which greatly affect social identity. James Adams agreed with Chuka on last week's advocacy and says, my boss, you're really saying something. Festus O says, following your program, The Advocate, I'm thoroughly enjoying this debate, and I sincerely ap appreciate your point on the Pan-Africanism presentation. Thank you, Debbie, James, and Festus for sharing your thoughts with us. Keep the conversation coming on our social media platform, on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, has hashtag The Advocate NG, and on Twitter and Instagram, at Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com forward slash The Advocate. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. After the break, Sedu looks inward to find a way forward. He says it's time to reflect. I can't wait to hear that. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. You're watching The Advocate on PLOS TV Africa. Quality, not quantity, when applied to life, points to a distinction between merely living and living properly. A time to reflect. The Holy Book teaches us that life must be numbered in days, and not years, so we can apply our hearts to wisdom. A few days ago, when the news of the demise of the wife of a prominent Lagos pastor broke, I was having a conversation with my wife, marveling about life and how feeble it is, and how we are constantly in pursuit of vanity at the cost of our life's purpose. So my question for you today is, what is your purpose? How would you like to impact lives? How do you wish to be remembered? Some people find this purpose in their pain, some in their talents, some in their significant life experiences. So we should remember that life is not a playground and must be taken seriously. A number of people believe that you must have certain amount of wealth to be able to impact life. However, it is important to note that neither age nor wealth is a barrier to impacting life. A little word of encouragement, a surprise visit, sharing knowledge, a shoulder to cry on, or a smile could be all that is needed to make all the difference. The pastor's wife, even though passed away so young, had left a remarkable legacy. This is apparent by the story shared by everyone who crossed her path. We learned that before she passed, she had a foundation that aided women with difficulty having children with IVF treatment. In fact, on her 40th birthday, she was going to help 40 couples have their babies through IVF. In her words, she wanted no parties, no surprises, but only to make 40 homes happy. It is never too late. The time to reflect is now. Start making a change, living intentionally. So I ask again, what is your purpose? Hmm. What's your purpose? Uh <laughs> 
<laughs> I would like to yeah. send my condolences again to the family of um, the Gudalos. I mean, her, her immediate family and even her extended family. And her extended family now extends to the society because she did a lot. I never met this woman, but the messages and the outpouring on social media and every other platforms just shows you how much she did. But bringing it down to us as a people, I think we need to also begin to demystify the idea of impact for people to understand um, that now taking it back to your initial advocacy, that the fact that you have a job and doing your job diligently is also an impact. Mm. Now, if you neglect that little part of service that you're even being paid for, how do you have the enablement to serve somebody else or even find your purpose? Mm. So it's not until you preach can on, touch... Preacher. No, please, I'm listening. I like what she's saying. A million <laughs> lives. Yeah, you're not good. until you can have the whole resources to, to touch lives in the magnitude that um, a woman like um, Ibidu Igodale did. It, that is not where it starts or ends. It's about how you touch the next person by your side, how you make your own responsibility a, a duty to also help right. others function well in their way of life. So I think we need to begin to break down what impact really is because they'll tell you, oh, I can't, I can't afford this. I don't know it. What do I have to help somebody else? But you alone as a person and the way you comport yourself is an impact to the impact. next person. Nafisa. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah I, I would definitely like to say that if you could, if I could then break down impact and legacy into one sentence, I would say, that is something that my auntie used to tell me when I was about 13 or 14. I was in Jersey SS1 that life is not just about you. Life is not just about you. And from that young age, it made me understand that, look, it's not even about you. It's not just about you, but it's also about other people as well. And, you know, could I say, fortunately, I was able to grow up with this sort of mindset, but not many people my age or younger exactly have you know, that kind of mindset. When it comes to um, entertainment and things that we absorb on social media, young people, that is, they see the flashy cars, they see the materialism, and that is what they define as what, you know, life is made all about. And during this pandemic, everyone's had to take a back seat. People have been, yesterday, Dan Foster died, you know, from the COVID-19 pandemic. A lot of people have died. Everyone has had to take a back seat and reflect and say, you know, life is so fragile. I could literally be lying down on this bed right now and something will happen to me. And it will be my RIP on Twitter that you'll be retweeting and saying, oh, she was a good person and everything. It mm -hmm. makes us think that what would I be remembered for? And yes, dem demystifying impact as well, that it's not until you have a million dollars, even a million naira to feed a thousand people. That's 200 naira that you can donate to that organization that is feeding the homeless at this point in time is making an impact. Mm -hmm. You know, like they say, if you don't want to be forgotten as soon as you are gone, uh, that do things worth writing or write things worth reading. Mm -hmm. And um, Martin Luther King, you know, spoke explicitly on this when he said, whatever you are, be the best of it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you are that little scrub, you know, be the best little scrub by the valley. And um, if you are a street sweeper, be the best street sweeper that when you die, you know, let it be written that here lies the remain mm -hmm. of a great street sweeper that when she left or he left, Nobody could sweep the streets Street so like well, yeah. and you know, and um, even um, and that's why I'm. I say I will remain, you know, at old school, the real school. Um, <laughs> Aru Kelly, you know, also talked about, you know, uh, I'm the sky up in the sky. I'm the mountain peak on high. Yeah. You know, yeah, but Kelly, uh, yeah. so so when you <laughs> put all of this together, um, you ask yourself, you know, what would I be remembered for? Mm. You know, how do I want people to see me? Mm -hmm. You know, when, I, when mm -hmm. I'm around, what do I want people to talk about? Uh, and really, with all of this that is happening with COVID-19, you actually ask yourself, what's the essence of life? Mm. You know, there's basically yeah. nothing apart from living for people. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, if you have a million naira today, take a sense or statistics of how much you spend for yourself. It won't be more than 200,000. You'll find out that, you know, you would spend it on things that ordinarily will affect you. So if you make conscious efforts to impact in people, all this complaint that we're complaining mm. won't be there. If you make effort, conscious effort, you remember you're a lawmaker, mm. you're there to make laws yeah. that will help the growth well, of society. Let me, let me, Rack, I'm hearing that. You know, so uh, I'll basically take from what everyone has said in summary, but I, I will only say that in terms of demystifying uh, impact, I would say, I tend to opt for, forget what people will say about you, because I think once you're focused on that, it somehow takes away from the reality of everyday life. I would say that everybody has the 
you say the seed of impact in them. So I, I think every human being has a gift. They have something they can actually do, no matter how small, like the street sweeper. So just focus on being, like everyone is saying, the best you can be. Don't worry too much about what people say after you're gone. You're gone. So just be yourself. Be the best of yourself you can be. And be, be genuine in what you're doing. That, for me, is, is all it takes. I'm not too hung up on what people say about me. They'll say what they like, you know. Whether they say good or bad, I'm still who I am. So just be sincere, be genuine, be authentic. And live your life. Should they be full. genuine godfathers too? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. genuine. I know nothing yeah. about godfathers. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So really, you can be a genuine godfather, and um, Sedu has said it frankly and sincerely as he can. After the break, I'll also be calling it what it is: uncertificated or even uncertified certificates. A nation where talks, writes election results for professors to announce will always produce governors and presidents with questionable credentials and uncertified certificates. To work in most private sectors in Nigeria, one must not only be below 25 years with three to four years working experience, he or she must also have a second class upper degree, what you call 2-1 in the university. But to become a member of the State House of Assembly, a governor, a member of the Federal House of Representatives, a senator, or even the president of the same country, the only educational qualification you require is school sets or its equivalent. That's section 106, section 177, section 65, and section 131 of the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria as amended. If you are still wondering why we have a president, governors, deputy governors, lawmakers, and even party chairmen whose certificate or credentials are questionable, then wait for the meaning of its equivalent. As defined by our laws in section 318, of the 1999 Constitution, its equivalent means anybody who can read and write in the opinion of the National Independent Electoral Commission, INEC. What a country. When the president was asked for a certificate between 2015 and 2019, rather than allow him to either present him or give a reasonable explanation otherwise, whalers and hailers were at each other's throat. As the request got lost in the shout of many of their voices, some even asked him to present teach you paper as certificates until the Supreme Court eventually came to his rescue. Same thing happened during Oshomole's tenure as governor when he was asked to produce his certificate. Those asking for a certificate today said then that since he could speak impeccable English, his certificate wasn't necessary. I don't even want to go to Tinubu's Chicago or Salisu Buhari's Toronto. As Dino Melai had to conduct his graduation at the National Assembly with a convocation gown to show that he graduated from ABU Zaria, I would learn it was after seven years for a four-year course. Obasanjo accused Good Luck Jonathan of not completing his PhD. I don't know about that one. Ayo Fayoshi, former governor of Ekiti State, claimed to have attended Ibadan Poli, but the institution is still trying to locate his name in their books. Maybe they should ask Gogo. Okay. Stella Odua's claim of obtaining a master's degree in St. Paul's College, Lawrenceville, in Virginia, USA, in 1983 is still a subject of controversy. No wonder many of them no longer parade these Oyibo certificates. The certificate of Senator Ademola Adeleke in Oshun governorship election is most laughable. APC and Bayesa deputy governorship candidate is still very fresh in our mind. I wonder if David Lyon and his supporters will ever forgive that guy. How many of us remember Evans or is it Evan, Ewerem now? God rest his soul. The list is endless. And now, the current governor of Edo State, Godwin Obaseki, or is it Obasek? Just like in 2016, he's also emerged in certificate scandal. And in all the cacophony of voices for and against him, the governor, typically of our politicians, is yet to take our time to explain to Nigerians what led to the discrepancies in the certificate. Rather, he has left the weighty matters to be chasing the shadows of passive enemy. It can only happen in Nigeria. If it is true that this certificate of these politicians are actually forty, then those who imposed him on the state in 2016 should be prosecuted. The question to our politician is, why are there always irreconcilable differences in their certificates? According to the provisions of section 465 of the criminal code, a person who makes a false document or writing, knowing it to be false, and with intent that it may, or it may be used or acted upon as genuine, whether in the state or anywhere, is said to have forged the document in writing. But how many of these politicians have we prosecuted? Another jam questions for you. But the most interesting and ironic part of this whole Edo State election saga is that the PDP, who have called Obaseki names and claim he doesn't have a certificate and have consistently scored him low in terms of performance since 2016, are now welcoming him with open arms. 
While on the flip side, the APC that crucified Isaiah Yamu in 2016 and called him unprintable names, including the one decent he won't allow me to mention here, are today calling him a political messiah. Ah, Nigerian politicians, even the devil go every now. Anyway, the campaigns and debates, if any, will be interesting. My advocacy today would be, until the people realize that development and growth in any society is a product of good followership, who are confident to question their leaders and consistently condemn to order using their tongue and other legal means, Nigeria will continue to have rulers whose integrity and certificate are not only questionable, but irreconcilable, uncertified certificate. I beg second base, Jerry. <coughs> I've been choking on laugh. I mean, you can laugh. Please laugh freely. Let me, let me quickly throw my own name because I, I know many people will have mm. my... Again, thank you for chronicling it for us. I don't know some of these people because I'm really not interested in a lot of politics because mm. it just looks like ringa ringa roses. People and you just... want a better society. Are you no, 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 no. When, 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 the right, when the right people step up to the plate, you notice how interested I will be. We're not discussing policy. We're not discussing ideology. We're discussing people and lost certificates. But just for the record, on an aside, Obaseki actually came forward. At least I watched where he explained what happened to his certificate. And he spoke good English for the record. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> he explained to us that initially... He didn't have his, because he hasn't used it in a long time. Mm -hmm. He didn't, so he had to do an affidavit form of, oh, mm -hmm. my certificate exists. Then later he found it. Mm -hmm. Now, those let me, discrepancies. Let me quickly, sorry, quickly, so that you don't, you don't run with it. In the affidavit, Obaseki said he left secondary school in 1976 and graduated in 1979. Mm -hmm. And so when the result came and they discovered that he had only three credits, they said, how can you use three credits to gain admission into university? He said he did A-levels. So in between these three years, at what point did you do, do A-level? That is where the problem is. Anyway, my problem is not even that. My problem is that we play politics too much. Like you said, the guy was, has been governor for one term. You didn't have any problem. Now you want him out. You go and find a loophole to get what him out. And that's why I lose it. That's why I lose it. That's why I told no, you. No, with the PDP, PDP brought it up, yes. but the APC had no problem. Well, I like, I like now, the APC you, you want to bring legal it. person yeah. this But let me just, finish, let me just drop it very quickly. It, because of what he just said, okay. does the constitution say that you have to have passed the school certificate or that you have to have a school living certificate? Just school, sir, bring it. Just bring but it. But the moment so, you put other certificates alongside that, those mm -hmm. other certificates become questionable. Ah, okay. Okay. Let me just quickly land the, I'll land the point, because actually I want, mm -hmm. I want to hear what you all have to say. But bottom line is I'm saying my problem with it, when we start looking at the solution, is to say, you're talking about the fact that our leaders are not educated. Most of Nigeria is not educated. And that's why most of Nigeria, when you're talking about getting the leadership in with thumb and legal means, we don't even recognize what a good leader is, much less to push for it. That's why so I'm advocacy. saying that the first person, the first base for me in terms of transformation has to be Let's look at what leaders are offering themselves and what their uh, mandate is. Is anybody prioritizing investment in education? If they are, they are a man, because that's where we need to start. We need to make sure that as many people as possible are exposed to the right quality of education and right thinking so that yeah. they're not going to pull the wool over our eyes. I'll, I'll leave it at that. So um, from Obasaki's camp, we'll tell you he's, um, he's, uh, he's prioritizing education. But let's hear what um, others have to say. Not yes, I, I, want to, I want to jump in quickly to say that I, I think we're flogging this issue of certificates and paper education uh, to trump that empathy and your people skill. For you to be a leader, these are very important uh, attributes. I now go back to people like uh, someone like uh, Ronald Reagan, that was president of the United States. He didn't have any degree. And yet he elevated that country to a point that other, other, other presidents are doing catch up today. We, we look locally here at Eliganza. Mm -hmm. He didn't have an education and that yet he built an empire. Should give us you yeah. if, if you have somebody who is passionate about people, you understand, you surround yourself with intelligent people, all the professors that will do the work. But once you know where you want to carry the country, to, you want to lead the country to, You'd, use, you'd create that environment and have that people touch. I think we're just going on and on about Seydou, this. Let me ask you a we quick question. Have, Sorry. Sorry. We've had professors who have failed. We have educated people who have failed. I want to quickly we need somebody a who has empathy. Who, and, and in any case, asking, this asking thing we call education is relative. It, it's relative. We've had people that will go to meetings and they speak their language. They, they, they communicate in a language that nobody understands. You understand? Education here is relative. You know, so you why did you education? go to school? <laughs> sorry, Nafisa, you have to come in because... Uh, yes, sorry. Taking... Yes, okay. So I'm going to come in and say that I guess why we have a particular emphasis on um, the certificates is because that certificate is the only, um, how do I put it, proof that 
you have some measure of critical thinking. That is the only that is our standard in Nigeria for measuring critical thinking. But my question is, okay, so we have these unqualified, inadequate people. How did we come about a system that constantly throws at us incompetent, inadequate people? Why do we constantly go through the wrong over and over and over? I think Libras again? refer Whenever to Whenever they want to dismantle the politician, Libras, they don't Libras say have, that the certificate is not, the Libras certificate is not original. That you need to the problem is, I, I gave you an instance. I said, you want... Say do that the same certificate is not necessary for governance or for leadership. How do you measure? No. If he wants to employ now, if he wants to employ, if Seydou wants to employ in his company, it shouldn't be the poor. If Seydou wants to employ in his company now, he will look for the right people with the right mindset, with the right qualification. No, it is I only think, no, here. I think the corporate Wait, let me, world let me, is let evolving, me, and let me, they are beginning to stay away from Do you know what they do? No, do you know what they do? They will train you. They will retrain you. They will retrain you. But here, there is no training for leadership. It's only in Nigeria where you want to be a leader, you don't need any training. For, for me, and no, you don't need critical thinking. Wait, wait, and then we say, yeah, that was why we told Buhari, this. bring tissue paper. And we are in, in toilets today. Our time is up, okay. Libra, take okay. it you know, away. Um, <laughs> Nafisa said something about it being a way to measure our critical thinking. But I just want to take that away and look at our politicians and how they politic in this country and say that they are actually an embarrassment. Because, because if we are talking about a man who you have certified to be governor in 2016, and you're suddenly coming to tell us now that because that of that... That is why they should be prosecuted. Th th this conversation is just really irritating and That's why they should be prosecuted. So all we're saying is, if the leadership don't measure up to their job, then it's our job to hold them to a standard. Keep the conversation going on on our social media platform, on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG, and on Twitter and Instagram at Plus TV Africa, hashtag The Advocate NG. And to catch up with previous broadcasts, just simply go to plustvafrica.com forward slash The Advocate NG. There are so many of them there. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Till next week, when we'll be joining our voices to yours in keeping the system honest and accountable and asking for certificates, let's keep advocating for a better society. Bye for now. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking, it's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.